You're listening to Depth Perception, supported by our patrons on Patreon. Hey, Leo here. Just wanted to give you guys a quick content warning. There's a couple times we touch on domestic violence in our discussion of Only Yesterday, and a little bit when we talk about My Neighbors the Amavas as well. Also, blanket spoiler alert on any movie that you hear us talking about. You've been warned. Here's our show. Welcome to Depth Perception. I'm Randy. I'm Leo. And today we're going to be talking about the films of Studio Ghibli. Um, I want to start by asking, Leo, do you, uh, do you think that Studio Ghibli films are special? Or do you think they're just good? Do I think they're special or do I think they're just good? You know, the more I watch, the more I think they're special. I think they're special too. I, I mean, my opinion is that movies are mostly not good. Just like books are mostly not good and music is mostly not good. But I think, there's, I think there is something very special about a Studio Ghibli movie. Uh, whether it, whether it comes from any of the directors, I mean, even even their worst movies have something to say for them, which is not true of of everybody. I mean, I think it's something that I think that's something that the Coen Brothers have. I think it's I think it's something that Disney has mostly. I mean, especially if you look at Disney, um, earlier Disney films in general. Well. Yeah, like Song of the South. Yeah, I know. That was ex- immediately that the image of just like, yeah, Song of the South came into my head immediately when I said that. Uh, there's definitely something to say for that movie. It's, it's a lot. It's not good. A lot of things you could say about it. I've never seen, I've never seen Song of the South. I've only seen uh, the part with the crows. I've only seen the, the, the zippity doo song. Yeah. Yeah. That, that That's what I mean. Somebody asked me to sample that once for a beat. Really? And I wouldn't do it. Yeah, I wouldn't do it. Wow. It was misguided of them. But um, so so we've both kind of been in a flurry of uh, of watching Studio Ghibli movies yes. in preparation, or Ghibli, in preparation for this for this episode. As long as you say Ghibli um, every once in a while, like, people, you know. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to go for fifty percent. Yeah, you you you're right there so far. <laughs> So, so which ones have you watched most recently? So me, I just watched My Neighbors the Yamadas like today. I just finished it. I watched... Which I also watched today yes. for the first time. Randy and I were discussing the fact that... So I've only had access to the English dubs of any of the movies that I've seen, except maybe when I saw Ponyo years ago. Don't remember. But anyways, I thought that My Neighbors the Yamadas, unfortunately, was sort of tainted by a, a very bad dub. But, which is a shame because Jim Belushi is renowned. Right, right. It, it was just actor. a fluke. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry, Jim. I do think I do think that I thought he was dead until I uh, looked it up, and that turned out to be his brother, uh, who is who is a blues brother. That's right. Um, I do think they they do tend to have pretty good dubs. I mean, I like I like watching the films in Japanese because I watch almost everything with subtitles anyway, regardless of whatever language it happens to be Mm -hmm. in. Um, I'm not usually a super active watcher of movies or TV. Um, But I do think the dubs are really good. I, and, and you look at some of the voice talent they get, which I think this is mostly to do with Disney. I don't think they had these, um, I don't think they had these voice actors initially or they, Miyazaki wouldn't have had so much trouble with the West, but I mean, you look at Nausicaa, you have Patrick Stewart in a starring role, which is great. Yeah, playing Patrick Stewart. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think Shia LaBeouf's in that. Yes, movie he too. is. Yes, he is. I was surprised um, to see. Christian Bale is Howl. In That's Howl's right. Castle, which is great. Um. I mean, I usually do have a problem with, like, when I do watch a dub, if the lip syncing is bad. Uh, with regards to my neighbors or Yamadas, it, it, they tried too hard in that case to, to make the lip reading 
Yeah, work. as I said earlier, the, the it just syn- looked like it was like OCD levels of like trying to match the the words to the. Yeah, this this the sync just didn't need to happen yeah. in that case. Um, especially when the movie is stylized after a comic strip. Yeah. I mean, Takahata could have probably used still images for that movie, and it would have been perfectly fine. Yeah. But but generally the dubs are really good. I think Spirited Away has a really good dub, I agree. which I haven't seen in a while. Um, up until this past weekend, I haven't seen the English dub of Spirited Away since I was little, little, little. But um, Princess Mononoke is another one that has a really, really excellent dub, star-studded cast. Yep. And is is really, I think Billy Bob Thornton kind of blows it uh, as the uh, as the monk in that movie. <laughs> His delivery, I think his delivery is just bad. Um, the lines are good and everything. I mean, they, they, they've treated the script well in that case. But I, I just think his performance wasn't great. But you know, they they wouldn't they wouldn't get these really good dubs for average movies or movies that weren't just you know some kind of spectacular. Um, just looking at the list I, I've made here, I, I, I'm not seeing a bad movie. Spirited Away, My Neighbor Totoro. I know you recently watched Totoro. I actually didn't and, know. Uh, I I, I th- recently rewatched um, Spirited Away, but I have not actually really seen Totoro. Oh, I thought you had told me a couple of weeks ago that you uh, like had an issue with Totoro. No, I'm, I might have mentioned that I tried to watch Totoro years ago. In a situation oh. where I couldn't really, see, well, I couldn't really watch it. Mm. Yeah, so it's kind of in the background. Yeah, Totoro, Totoro's an interesting one. There's, there's a pretty common thread amongst my favorite Ghibli films. Um, but just going down the list here, I mean, Princess Mononoke, Howl's Moving Castle, Nausicaa, The Valley of the Wind. Which I have you seen? Yes. You have. Excellent. That's I a great love one. Love Nausicaa. Yeah. I have the, uh, I have the manga, by Miyazaki, up on my bookshelf there. Cool. Um, Kiki's Delivery Service, which is great. That's one of the many one of the many criers in in Studio Ghibli's filmography. And then uh, of the Takahata films, I think I must have written down all of them because I've got five of them here. Only yesterday, which I watched for the first time, only yesterday, and I thought I thought it was just one of the most incredible movies I've ever seen. It, it was it was super emotional for me. Um, just in the way that it went. And I, we'll probably talk about our favorite Ghibli movies, and that will probably be mine. Um, Grave of the Fireflies, Pompoko, My Neighbors the Yamadas, and The Tale of Princess Kaguya, which I haven't seen, you haven't seen. No. So so what are what are some of your favorites that you have seen? I mean, you've seen well, let me just five rattle, or six of that. I should just rattle off what I've seen because I haven't seen yeah. all that many. So I saw Ponyo when I was little. Um, pretty, I mean, when I was a teen. Really enjoyed it. It was like, okay. Kind of reminded me of some Disney movies, but was distinctly different. Hard to remember now. Um, but I felt like I, I got it. Like I, I think I felt like I met, I met it where it was. And it, it like just was a great kids movie, basically, to me at the time. And then I watched years later, kind of watched Totoro. Didn't really, wasn't really paying attention regrettably um later um recently this year i watched spirited away like in january or so and loved it um the first time i saw it and just rewatched it by the way then i watched then recently i with hosmic um i watched um mononoke i thought mononoke was really cool it didn't it didn't sort of, I don't know, feed my imagination as much as Spirited Away did, just at like at this at its face. But um, it's a there's really not, there's not as much room for interpretation. That's true. Exactly. In, it's like more of a it okay. it's more of like a straightforward allegory to me. I mean, I think it just is. Yeah. And and then I saw. Oh, I also saw Howl's Moving Castle very recently, which was great. Um, I love, especially visually. Um, but also, I mean, story, but I just visually, it's one of the most unique. It's like a very unique movie visually. I've I've read that that was uh, treated as 
It's it's based off of a book, which I, I wish I had looked up when the book was written. But I've read that the um, the movie is treated as allegorical for the invasion of Iraq. Mm, interesting. Which, you know, technically these movies are propaganda. Everything's propaganda. But um, there's a, an anti-war streak a mile wide through through Studio Ghibli films. Um, what was it about Spirited Away, do you think, that, that makes it the Studio Ghibli movie? Well, I'm, I'm hearing the influence of the various videos that you had posted in our resources. Uh, and I think that what at least one of them was saying was sort of the visual storytelling is really precise and really, like, effective. Uh, rewatching it, I was stricken by, in the beginning, how Chihiro, everything in like her world is alive and, and sort of, and then it's, you know, and you're seeing this develop, you're seeing her sort of like, as they get out of the car in the beginning and they're going down the tunnel, every, she's sort of skeptical of everything and the parents are sort of removed from it. Um, you hear her mother sort of say that the, the shrines, you know, some people think that goes, it's like, it's really clear that like the parents her parents aren't like invested in the world spiritually in the way that she is mm. like naturally. Um, and then when she, and I was about to say this before when she explicit, when it's explicit is like when she hears the gust of wind come out of the, the, the building that they were in um, as they're emerging into the field. And she says like it, it moaned and it, it was just the wind, you know, but that, that like that tendency that she has ends up being key in the rest of the movie to her, like getting through, the situation she finds herself in in the bathhouse like she has to keep coming back to um sort of and i think that miyazaki quote really summed it up really well um that first link that you sent well yeah i'll, I'll yeah it'd be better to now. actually just give a little information rather than saying the first link yeah so this is through um this is courtesy of nausicaa.net uh it's an interview with Hayao Miyazaki on Spirited Away. That's right. Um, he says, It's not a story in which the characters grow up, but a story in which they draw on something already inside them, brought out by the particular circumstances. I wanted to tell such a story in this movie. I want my young friends to live like that, and I think they, too, have such a wish. Um, the, thing, the thing that I think is really palpable in Spirited Away, and that he talks about in that same interview, is that it's, it's a movie that was made specifically for 10 year old girls and when you you look at a lot of these animated movies that are are made for the general audience you know it, they they feel disconnected from any sort of reality because they're not speaking to anybody you know they're trying to speak to everybody and and the thing the thing that spirited away touches on is just the um just the experience of of how Miyazaki imagines a ten year old girl living her life, and it's something I think is great in in all of the Ghibli films, and not just Miyazaki's. Is um, I I think they're really distinctly feminist movies. There's there's male heroes. I mean, I would call Howl a male male hero. Hero Ashitaka is a male hero. The uh, the boy in Ponyo. I mean, there's not really any conflict in Ponyo, right? I haven't seen Ponyo. I, yeah, I feel silly talking about it because I haven't seen it in so long. That, but, mm. but it, 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 they're they're feminist movies, you know, and every every one of them has an ideology. I mean, there's not one lazy toe the line movie in in the entire filmography. You know, I just finished watching Pompoco a while ago, and and the you know the tree hugger thing is present in so many of these movies. It's um, I, I read a quote from Miyazaki. I don't know if it wound up in the uh, in the doc that we share, but um, he was talking about how he he doesn't believe in Shinto, which I thought was really interesting considering the uh, the the topics covered in his movies. 
but he he says that animism is deeply ingrained in him and i i feel that way as well i mean i don't believe in shinto but i i feel like some principle of animism is like present in everybody which is why these these themes hit hit us so hard but pompoko is an interesting one first of all i've never seen more testicles in my whole life than i did in that movie the tanukis that's right i didn't see yeah. it but i haven't seen it but i i saw the, even on the the promo poster they're, they're like the testicles are practically a character unto themselves but it's it's a story of these animals that have to try and get their um get their land back from people there's a development being made on on their forest and something that takahata does in most of his movies i don't remember it in grave of the fireflies so much it's definitely there but it's it's not quite so prominent in that movie but they um it's the use of the abstract surreal elements to highlight the real emotion of the characters instead you know in in a miyazaki movie the the surreal really takes a forefront i mean there's there's nothing realistic in Spirited Away or Princess Mononoke except for the feelings. Where in in a Takahata movie, the most kind of unreal things are the feelings. And that's not to say that they're not actual true feelings. I mean, only yesterday made me really really emotional. Um, there's a scene in that movie where. Taiko, in, in her memories, is, is remembering that she had a conversation with a boy that had a crush on her. And as they turn away from each other, he, he goes, like, tossing a baseball to himself down the street. And she runs up an imaginary flight of stairs and breaststrokes through the sky, you know, in front of these gorgeous pastels. And it, that, that was the first thing in that movie that made me cry. There was a lot of things in that movie that made me cry. But um, Pompoko does this as well, where they, I instead of instead of taking the time to make you sit through watching the environment be destroyed, there's a quick montage that shows two giant backhoes, I guess, digging out the sides of the mountain, and a bunch of little backhoes taking apart a leaf, and all this, and that's... It's it's in in the same way that the Coen brothers are really able to highlight emotion by making use of, of surreal elements like in No Country for Old Men. I, I mean, the coin flip scene is completely surreal. It, it doesn't feel like something that could happen, but it is. Well, it happens twice, I suppose. But those are some of the most palpably emotional moments in that film i don't know how the book goes with regards to that i haven't read it probably not going to read it neither have i Corbin mccarthy is great but i'll stick to um blood meridian and i read one of his books in early i read i read um the road i liked it the road's a sad one sad one i tried to read all the pretty horses and for some reason just couldn't but I don't think that's because it's a book that I, I, I don't think it's because I think it's a bad book. I just wasn't at the time interested. Uh, there is a lot that I wanted to ask you, like sort of touch on and ask you yeah. about. First of all, I, I'm excited to watch Pompoko. Um, the, the, that bit that you said it's, about the, uh, the backhoes, it, like was intriguing to me. It's, it's another one of those movies. I mean, I said this to you yesterday or today that, Grave of the Fireflies is one of the best movies I've ever seen, yeah. and I'm probably not going to watch it again. I don't think I'm going to... I might not watch Pompoko again. I wanted to challenge you on something. You said Hit you me. said that the least real thing, in a way, about um, about Takahata's movies was the emotion... Or was, yeah, the emotion. What did you mean by that? Well, what I mean is the, emo the, the emotions themselves are real. I mean, when when Taiko runs up the imaginary stairs, like... I know exactly what he's depicting, but he depicts it in in the way that you're not going to see in, in a Miyazaki movie where what happens in 
Spirited Away is that Sen breaks down crying because she ate a dumpling. You're talking about, you're saying that when he wants to, sh- so that when he, his use of surreal elements versus Miyazaki's is that he's more likely to employ them um, in a way that is obviously a break from the continuity of the film to show an emotion, whereas Miyazaki might bathe you in surreal elements and then, but but not... And then draw them back. And then draw them back. Yeah. Well, here's here's the thing is that when when Takahata uses this surreal, for example, uh, the in Pompoko when uh, when the Tanukis are experiencing different emotions, they are animated differently. You know, they go there's there's they have a stage of animation where they very much resemble the comic books, and they don't look anything like they do the rest of the movie. There's a um, there's a stage where they're really realistic, you know, raccoons. And there's a stage where they're super anthropomorphized mm-hmm. and they're constantly, you know, having costume changes and everything. Hey, yeah, I caught th- that uh, that a bit, a bit of a bit a sequence I would say of like ten seconds in in one of the videos that you sent me showed the Tanuki's yeah. sort of depicted in three different ways in a very short period of time. Uh, yeah, and that happened. That happens a lot throughout. the I film. also saw that in um, my neighbors the Yamadas. There's a specific sequence that yes. I really liked too. It's. It took me a second to realize why, like, sort of what why what was going on. Honestly, um, when they when the um. When, Takashi is sort of selected to go out and deal with, um, these bikers who are making a lot of noise. Mm-hmm. And uh, when he's walking up, they're depicted, all of them as very realistic, and it lends this yeah. weird and anim- like anonymity sort of, to the perspective, like all of the sort of like cute exaggerated traits of the comic book character uh are reduced to sort of this proportionally realistic shadowy uh stiff yeah the uh the tone of the movie completely very changes. interesting moment yeah um it it happens in uh it happens in only yesterday as well in a, in a different way um it takes place like i would i would say like half the movie takes place in Tycho's memories of being in 5th grade and half of it takes place while she's taking a vacation out to her uh her family's farm in the country um the the memories are really fuzzy they're washed out the the colors are more simple the um the animation is just as good, but the colors are a lot more simple. The backgrounds are a lot more simple. The the edges are blurred, you know, which is is an effect used to portray that it is a memory. Some it's something that's that's fuzzy and fading. Yes. Um, it, you know, in pump. Another one in uh, my neighbors the Yamadas actually that really stuck out to me was when um, Nonako is lost when she's at the store, and. Uh, I think it's when they realize that maybe she's at home and the the movie becomes really red. You know, it goes, it, it, there's like a palette swap mm. in the movie almost. Things become really red, like very, uh, you know, very enhanced warm colors. Um, I would say the movie generally is pretty warm colors, but um, a lot, lots of reds, like the... I don't think the frame rate changes or anything, but the animation looks so different uh, at, at this time when they're speeding home. Um, and and again, Takahata uses changes in the animation and to to depict the emotions that people are feeling in in a way that makes them resonate a lot more. And I think Miyazaki does just the opposite. Like like I said, we he draws back the surreal elements. To uh, to show emotion, and I I think I think what Takahata does hits me harder. You know, there's there's a scene in Only Yesterday when Taiko gets slapped by her by her dad, and um, it's it's in her mem it's in one of her memory sequences, and just the the feeling of that. I mean, I was never hit as a kid, but the Excuse me, I just burped. But the the way that the animation is is pulled back from the realistic style of the movie, which you're 
you're you kind of get accustomed to um is really impactful i i think uh i think i think the well the fact that takahata has gone is is sad really sad just knowing that he's not going to make another great movie um and miyazaki's 80 or something like that yeah so he's only got so many movies left in him i mean he's producing one now or directing maybe called how do you live that i'm i'm excited to see but it it hit me today while i was i i was also looking through the notes that i threw together yesterday and it just hit me today that like there 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 are a finite number of these movies i i don't think anybody can replicate them i don't think i i don't know whether studio ghibli survives hayao miyazaki but um you know there there there's not there's not a ton of these movies and there aren't a ton more that are coming uh, goro miyazaki is making a movie right now that doesn't look great I'm definitely going to give it a watch. But where do you think these where do you think these movies stand once Miyazaki is gone with Takahata being gone with Suzuki being very old? It's hard for me to give an intelligent, you know, an informed answer because after all I haven't seen all that many of these movies, but I think, especially, I mean, it's, you know, regrettable that I've only seen one Takahata movie, especially. Well, it's regrettable in the way that you haven't seen them yet, but it is not regrettable in the fact that you get to see them for the first time. That's true. That's true. I mean, I think that's definitely the most special time to see a Studio Ghibli film is for the first time. I don't know. I was trying to think what to compare them to, you know, what to compare them to, because that's, I guess that's where I would go to try to answer this question when I asked myself a similar question this morning or earlier in today I was asking myself something like all right like is so so it's pretty clear that Studio Ghibli's fame is resting on the reputation of these two co-founders of the studio and I don't even I, I don't even know how much Takahata has to do with it honestly yeah I think it I think it mostly rests on what Miyazaki has done Mm. Um, because there really are only three or four movies that ever get brought up when when people think about Studio Ghibli, and that's yeah, kind of they're all Miyazaki movies. Well, that's true, but also I have I had the vague sense that that's probably more of a thing in terms of like the Western distribution. It's like mm-hmm. it's influenced. Yeah, I mean, he definitely has the more marketable movies. I don't think um, I don't I don't think you could get. What happened to Spirited Away with My Neighbor is the Yamadas? Mm-hmm. But having ha- having just seen three of Takahata's films in the past two days, it, it made me think about what I really like about Miyazaki's movies. I like the uh, I like the slice of life moments, and that is o- almost entirely what. Takahata's movies are are slices of life. Yeah, and I think I think people might perceive them as being more shallow. You know, I th- I think I think people might not think much of My Neighbors the Yamadas or Only Yesterday, or even Ocean Waves, which is a movie that neither of them directed, but which is another very very nice Studio Ghibli movie. Um, there there. People people might think of them as more shallow. Maybe they won't, but I, I think I think the fact that they kind of just let you observe real life for a minute because they they do these things are real. Like uh, what happens in My Neighbors the Yamadas, it's all realistic things. I mean, nothing crazy happens outside of this real moments. I mean, nobody takes the reins of a snail from their grandmother or their mother in law. But that's true. Speak for yourself, buddy. <laughs> I can't only speak for myself. That's true. But 
I think even in an image like that, I mean, there's there's something, there's like a deep thing in there about how he perceives, you know, the responsibilities of the father in Japanese culture. I, I can't speak to that. I mean, there was a moment in the Fargo TV show where um, I have to call him Fat Damon. I think his name is Jesse Plemons, but he looks like Matt Damon if you put on weight. Um he's he's in a police car and he's talking to uh he, Patrick whatever he who's uh who's arrested him and they're they're talking about uh you know whether whether men are burdened or privileged you know having to kind of take responsibility for the well-being of a family and everything and i think I think you get to see that really well in in my neighbors the Yamadas. Um and it's it's there's a real there's a real stark difference between how it's portrayed in the English versus the Japanese, I think. I was going to say cuz again, um well actually I don't know if we've really explored this yet. I can t- com- completely since I haven't seen the Japanese version at all. And I, but I've seen the English, the full. I've seen. I watched all about of the twenty English minutes version. of the English um, before I switched to Japanese. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. I mean, like, like Takashi is an asshole and like a kind of a brutal father. I mean, not not all the time. And that's the the weird thing about it is it's kind of there's moments when if you excerpted them, his personality seems much more like fair and nice. Like it's a different person. But if you have the parts where he's just like ordering people around and being verbally abusive like it he just kind of su- he just kind of sucks and it, it's very it paints a picture of just like um oh my god what's his wife's name i forget I don't right now his wife's name what's i remember wife's Chikashi name? and Nonako. we talked about the scene where the wife is trying to change the channel and yes i i was i was happy to hear that it was played it sounds like it was played pretty much the same in English as it was in Japanese. Yeah, that was one of the more playful. Oh yeah, so okay. Wait, Matsuke Yamada. She is doing all the work basically all the time, and uh, he'll just be like, "Hey, like, do this for me. Oh, do this, do this," and that's like, <laughs> like it's played as comedy in the English. Yeah, version. I, I did. I it did. Sucks. <laughs> well, that that very much does happen in in Japanese as well. I mean these movies they they don't depict life literally as much as they depict feelings. So I think I think maybe the perception is is going to be the put upon wife. I mean it's the same thing in any any sitcom. Right? That's true. Yeah, it's not really anything about you know about Japanese culture. Um Well, I, yeah, sort of a, I mean I mean inherently I mean it's just it's just like a sort of a it's, it's the trope. something about like patriarchy, yeah. yeah. But I mean, she she also has has plenty of time in the movie where she's calling the shots. I think, um, mostly with regards to the kids. I I mean, she uh, there's that scene with uh, with the son whose name is his name Noboru. I think he, so. Yeah. Um, he walks in on his dad listening to tapes of people speaking English so he can learn to speak English. Is that what happens in, uh, is that what happens in the, the English translation? It's not specified what language he's listening to. Well, in, in Japanese he's, he's learning English and, uh, you know, the son walks in and he says, you know, he says something to his dad and you, you see the mother just saying study, study, study. And it becomes like the chorus and, yeah, I don't know who I don't know who the old person that like pops up three or four times in in the clones of his mother are, but yeah, I noticed they weren't all <laughs> the yeah, same. But the 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 dynamic is interesting in that it's um I think there's I think it's a lot more uh, a lot more stark in in only yesterday where uh, you know the the dad is is really shitty in that I mean he hits his he hits. Tycho because she forgets her shoes as she's leaving the house. Um, 
he uh, he he sits at the table with a newspaper while everybody's eating, and at least once, I think it probably happens a couple of times, but at least once he like interrupts his wife from eating to go and get his plate. Y- you know, I I I don't know whether mm-hmm. um. I I don't know whether that's commentary on Japanese culture or or just patriarchy in general. I have a feeling, given the feminist bent to the movies, that it's probably a commentary on patriarchy generally. Well, I, not that I feel. I mean, I, we've established that maybe the the difference between the uh, in, the Japanese version and the English dub isn't as stark as I was imagining it to be. But I think that there's something that 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 gets lost and feels kind of I think it, just like it, it doesn't feel natural in the I, English version it I doesn't think feel it, natural I think it must be pretty Jim stark Bolucci. because there was only one moment in the movie where I thought that Takashi was being shitty no he's 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 shitty he's shitty yeah, often was, and he, the, you think that Jim Belushi was like drinking <laughs> during some of the like uh like Orson Welles <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, not to shit on Jim Belushi's performance too hard. It could have been who wrote it too. But yeah, I, um, I, I don't, I don't know. If but Disney I, I wanted that. to say one thing. Go, by all means. I know that yeah, I know Disney was pretty involved in in the dubbing a lot of the mm. time with these movies, and is partly responsible for their international yeah. success. Is the Disney Connect? But um, or well, I say partly responsible. I mean, they yeah. distributed the movies, a lot of them. So, um, uh. Now, what did I want to say? I think I just wanted to say that... Oh, yeah, there's a section um, of... Uh, you know how the, the movie is, of course, broken into sections. There's a section called uh, Patriarchal Supremacy Restored. I don't know what the trans- yeah. what, what that's being translated from, if it's the same. Yeah, in the, you know, um, in I the, think it probably was that. I, I think I misread it as paternal supremacy. Sure. But it, it may well have been... It may well have been patriarchal. Yeah, I thought that was. I mean, just to to highlight. No, but in that, that segment, like that's not what happened. I feel like. No, I no, mean, not really. Was, that was pretty mild. Yeah, it was. Too. What was that? That was him playing catch with with his son, right? Or was that him? Actually, I'm having trouble. Or was that when that. he wanted to take a picture of the snow? I think it might have been yeah. this. No. But that's like you know that's I like think... a gag though. Right, it's a gag. Well, it's played. Yeah, it's played as like a, like a, like an ironic. Yeah, I, uh, I'm kind of dreading, watching the English translation, which is too bad because I paid like five dollars more for it than I did for Japanese. <laughs> but, and if if people haven't figured it out, this is going to be a bit of a looser podcast than the last one. Um. For sure, yeah. And in fact, I didn't want to just because I've that's the only one I've seen by Takahata doesn't mean we have to talk about it like the whole time. If if you want to um, move on to something that you have more to say on, well, um, I, go ahead. I would recommend people watch any of these movies. I mean, there's not one that I would say don't watch. I mean, even Earthsea is good, and I think that's definitely the worst one I've seen. But it's still a really good movie. It's still so much better than, you know. The thing, the thing that I kind of lean towards in in Studio Ghibli movies are the slice of life moments. Um, it's, it's Chihiro and the baby and whoever the fly is and No Face on the Train in uh, in Spirited Away, or when uh, when Ashitaka and the monk are talking over rice in Princess Mononoke. Um, it's all of My Neighbor Totoro. I think that was I think that was entirely just a slice of life movie. Um, what, I, what I was saying earlier was that these, mov- these slice of life movies, I worry they might be perceived as really shallow. Um, but I think I think there's actually a lot of depth to them. Um, they they give you a chance to sit and look, you know, because I, th- I think, I think when you're just observing life, you can't help, but put yourself into it. Like, um, 
you know, you you when you're like stuck on a bench at the mall or something, and you you see stories happening, you know, just in the people walking by you or whatever. I think I think it gives you a chance to be reflective. I have something. I have a little anecdote yeah. uh, that it's not like a positive example of this, but it is nonetheless an example. So I'm a census taker right now. That's mm-hmm. my job. Um, so I can talk about things in a limited way without disclosing any information. And lucky for me, I didn't know anything about either of the two people. There were two people on the street as I was walking down the street, um, talking. One was, a some like student, I think that was looking for a place. And the other one was clearly a landlord and he was going on to him about how this is the neighborhood you want to live in. You don't want to live into that, in that other neighborhood. You know, if you know what I mean, it was, cl- he was clearly like dog whistling, like yeah, racism about this other place. Yeah, and uh, the the guy was like French or something, and I don't think he was getting it. He was just like uh, picking up on the trust cues, like, "Oh, trust me," you know. And the guy clearly just wants to sell, you know, sell him, renting him an apartment. Oh, you know, over there, you know, the reason that there's vacancies the is because track. it's not a good neighborhood. Yeah, so that was going on. And if I didn't have my census gear on, I straight up would have walked up and been like, "He's just he's just trying to manipulate you. He's being racist." But you know, I, I'm government shit on me. I I, I probably. Probably that guy could have made a big thing out of it if I had done that, and it wouldn't have ended well for me. Would have reported you to Cuomo. (laughs) Yeah. So, but yeah, because I was in like my work clothes and had other shit going on in my life, it be I was an observer. You know, I was limited to that, and I saw a story. Something about like being a passive observer that that makes you think more deeply. You know, because I bet. That guy who, uh, you know, the guy who is trying to sell an apartment to the Frenchman, you know, he's not thinking about it. The French guy is probably not thinking about it, but you had a chance to as somebody that's a, that was observing it. Um, there's there's a moment in Only Yesterday where uh, where Tycho is, is talking about a boy that was in her class who wore the same thing to school every day. He smelled bad. He was always dirty. He, um, nobody, nobody liked him, and she always thought that she hated him more than anybody else did. I mean, she, she says that she never, um, she never treated him badly or anything. Which, you know, you, that movie's really special, and I really think people should watch that one. Um, maybe, maybe it's just special to me, but the. There were kids like that at our school. I mean, I'm not going to name names, but there were kids that everybody hated. Everybody picked on. You know, there was... I didn't even think I ever had a second thought about picking on some of those kids. Um, But it really really made me think about it. You know, because at the end of her story, she says that as he was... At the end of the year, he he was moving away and... The teacher suggested that he go around and shake everybody's hand in the class. And she was the last one, and he said, I'm not going to shake your hand. And um, it, it made me think for a while. I mean, I paused the movie to think about how how we treated those people in school, how you treat those people at work. I mean, I'm lucky that I don't have to interact with any of my coworkers, <laughs> except for 15 minutes at the start of the day. But... At my last job, my job before that, job before that, there was people I didn't want anything to do with for no reason or no good reason. I mean, there was plenty of reason, but there wasn't any, any anything that I could justify even to myself, you know, in hindsight, which is, um, I don't know. I think that's another one of the things that's special about Ghibli movies is regardless of whether you like a particular movie or not, they're, they make you think about something that you you probably weren't thinking about because you it's like it's like that Miyazaki quote I read at the beginning you know you thought you were safe or maybe I didn't read it maybe I ought to it's um you know about how you're safe because it's just a cartoon yes I read that um he says uh yeah do read it and I have to thank you for this because you you put this in here I think right no, you put that one. I put oh, the one at the top. Okay. 
What you so this is um, cartoons are a form of escapism, a fake world. Because they are fake, they disarm viewers, making them think they're just cartoons. Liberated from reality and relaxed, viewers find themselves pulled into scenes, and they may find the experience evokes secret longings in themselves. They may start feeling braver and more heroic, more generous in spirit, and then they may also find they feel a little more energized. Um, I think that's what I th that's what I think s the slice of life things do. And that's what I think is, is really powerful about the, the train sequence in Spirited Away. It doesn't really happen in Princess Mononoke, aside from a couple. You know, you hear the story of the lepers and the, um, the working girls when, uh, when Ashitaka first gets to Iron Town. Yeah, but, most, but you're right. Most of the, the situations where that would have happened in another movie um, are played sort of as background. Even, like, for example, um, the scene where, like, they're what are they doing like leading cattle yeah and like it like it but like it's it's like just sort of like what's going yeah. on so that for for ex expositional purposes it's not really yeah, built on you're not empathizing with the people who are doing it the time. right i you get you get time to later i mean they 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 almost don't they're almost it almost seems like he he's portraying these characters as to like not be worth empathy at the beginning, you know, you, you, you empathize yeah. with them as Ashitaka learns to empathize with them. Um, but I think, I think Mononoke is an interesting one because it really kind of sets aside most of the tropes of a Ghibli film. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't use any of these pillow shots really where you're just, you're stepping away from the scene and you're looking at nature happening in the background or yeah that's true it, it it does happen a bit but mostly mostly what's going on in that movie is plot and story yeah yeah and it also it's interesting it doesn't really have a we were talking about you we were talking before about mononoke and spirited away having a similar structure and in certain ways maybe they do but it, like but Spirited Away is basically like a monomyth yeah. like hero cycle. Mononoke maybe is kind of, but it doesn't obey all of the rules. Um, the obvious one for me is that it doesn't return where it's it doesn't return to where it starts. Like in the beginning of that movie, we learn that Ashitaka mm. is gonna die basically. Um, and actually, like he doesn't. You know, at the beginning of the movie, also mm. that he's not gonna return home. Like his mission is to go fix he's, shit he's and then banished. die. Um, yeah, uh, and then, well, he doesn't return home, so there isn't. We but we know from the beginning it's not going to be like a like a monomyth in a way. Like it's not going to be like a like a literal hero's journey where he returns to the yeah. same place at the end. But, and in fact, like his expectations are subverted though. On the other hand, where he learns that he's not going to die, so that's that's nice. Um, or well, a spirited there, away again is, is there's pretty, a quote a at the beginning tight. of uh, there's a line at the beginning of, of Princess Mononoke. Um, I don't I don't I don't think it's very different between Japanese and English, but it's uh, it's the old woman, who I suppose is probably you know the village elder, or something. Uh, she it's it's when all the uh, all the the men of the town are gathered and Ashitaka is cutting his hair. You know, she says, yeah. you cannot change fate, but you can rise to meet it. And um, I think I think that's like the thesis of that whole movie. Um, because Ashitaka would have died if it weren't for the things that he did. I mean, the that's the, true. the dear God doesn't save him because he he's benevolent. You know, he's a, he's a god of life and death. He yeah. he could have just as easily taken his life to give something else life. Um, but he he earned. He earned it by uh, just through his actions by saving those two guys from Iron Town. You know, or by challenging yeah. Lady Uboshi. And I mean, there's more. There's other ways to to, um, sort of fulfill that line. You know, that don't involve him being rewarded with his life. I think that Miyazaki, though, tends to both a little bit in aesthetics and also in um, 
maybe development tends to do things with a little bit more of a like a Disney flavor to them. What do you mean by that? Um, I mean that I, I don't mean it's not that. Derogatory. I, I, I feel like it's easy to interpret that. Yeah. No, it's not derogatory. I just mean like in spirited. The two examples I'm thinking of are this actually. Like, main character doesn't die when they think they're gonna die. Um, that struck me as that just struck me as something in common with Disney. Another example. Um, the other obvious example that I could think of was um, in Spirited Away when, like, it's true love um, is what saves... Haku. Uh, what's his name? Wow, I can't... Yeah, true love is what... Yeah, when it's true love that saves Haku. Um, third example, just the aesthetics. I know from that interview that you posted from Nausicaa.net that Miyazaki loves this mixing of Japanese and Western Definitely. aesthetics. I mean, it's all over. Like it's emotional it's and nostalgic. Like, that's what I was going to say. The third example yeah. is aesthetically howl. Um, something about that aesthetic is evocative of like on its own, but it also invokes Disney um, to me a little bit um, just because of like the Victorian aspect of it. And I think about, Honestly, like the animated sequence of Mary Poppins, it's not it's not like really that similar, but there's something it's about funny, it. I don't that, remember there that being like, an animated sequence in Mary Poppins. Yeah, when they go into the chalk drawing. Yeah. It's a cool sequence. I probably haven't seen that since grade school. Um but you're right. Uh I don't I I don't remember where I read it or saw it or however I ingested it. But um there there was something I saw about Japanese animation being directly influenced by what Disney was doing in the early days with mm -hmm. Steamboat Willie and all these cartoons. Um, Interesting. You know, how, how they give, how they, they, that's how they learned the way that they give characters personality with big expressions, really, uh, really enhanced features on plastic faces, which is a trend that I think, um, I think Takahata kind of, kind of bucks in uh in something like only yesterday where he he draws pretty well he doesn't actually draw for the most part but um they the characters have realistic bone structure and it, it there's a little bit of uncanny valley going on but it's almost from the other direction in a weird way um and it's it's almost it's almost as if humans are looking a little bit too cartoony as opposed to cartoons looking a little too humany because they are still very very highly stylized and all this but there there's there's something about the way that these characters are drawn that fuses fuses western and eastern style i mean in in howl's movie castle it's like victorian architecture with japanese language everywhere like there's there's a very japanese looking street market um i mean kiki's delivery service for example is it's all western stuff drawn with that anime sensibility i mean everybody is everybody's a white person in that movie i wonder what you mean by aesthetics because i don't i don't think when you say aesthetics i don't think you mean just the way that something looks right no. So talk about that. No. Because I I want to understand more about what you mean when you say that. I'm I mean I mean I mean partly in the way things look the, the sort of the uh, psychedelic, just sort of like the psychedelic sort of opium dream kind of sort of dream like ty style of surrealism and fantasy is is reminiscent of even things like Fantasia you know. Um, yeah, Fantasia's Disney. a trip. I yeah. I was I was going to tell you uh, before we recorded this. I didn't think it would come up, but um. It did. Pom Poco is psychedelic as shit. That is a trippy movie, um, mm. which is really interesting because you don't. I don't typically associate that with anime. Sure. I mean, I don't watch a lot of anime. I do like anime, but I, I think it's good when a, a movie involving animals has has some kind of psychedelic elements to it, like a, involving the perspective of animals. Because I, whenever I try to to wonder what it's like to be an animal, I, I tend to, my mind tends to say, well, what if it's like, you know, 
what if it's like drugs? And not that it is like drugs, but that that would be the closest thing if I could experience it. That's something I really appreciate about um, Princess Mononoke, is that it takes the time, and I think this is also true of Pompoko, um, especially in the way that they anthropomorphize the animals. But it, it, it takes the time to remind you that we are animals. Mm. You know, that we... When, when we stop doing things that satisfy animality, um, things start to go bad. I mean, that's, that's the entire thing that's happening with, uh, with Irontown and Lady Eboshi. Is, is they're denying the, uh, you know, the natural world in favor of the things that they can build. You know, the world that they can create for themselves. There was uh there was something I read about um the like the overarching theme of the movies that Miyazaki and Takahata make being the interplay between intrinsic and extrinsic value of nature. Um I don't that's not it's not true of all the movies i mean like in only yesterday for example there's this really sweet passage um where taiko is is picking these particular flowers and uh they're use they're golden flowers that the the phrase that she uses is like they're they're golden flowers that are crushed to make red dye which becomes worth its weight in gold mm. and it, it had me thinking last night well, I was in the shower after I watched that movie, and the shower lends itself to, like, sober stoner thoughts. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but I was thinking, like, how much more of a statement is, like, is that golden flower, like, tuck, tucked in your hair or behind your ear? You know, how much more of a statement is that than the rouge that the flower makes on somebody's lips, you know? The, the... That's something that you don't get out of a lot of Western animation. I mean, there's there's bound to be some woke people doing cool animation in the West. I mean, um, Brian Kanyesko and Michael Dante DiMartino did it recently. Well, not recently, a long time ago, with Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra. You know... I mean, those shows are, like, all about intrinsic and extrinsic value of the natural world. But it doesn't, it, you don't see it a lot, especially out of Disney, which, like, I feel like they almost go out of their way to make movies that are not thematic of anything. I watched a really good uh, YouTube mini-documentary recently, well, earlier this year, about the remakes of, like, old Disney movies and how, like, they're, they're remaking Dumbo and they're, well, they... I don't mean to say that I think <laughs> they haven't they yet. Dumbo. They already have, in fact. And, you know, removing... Dumbo the, is a, another psychedelic aspect. Right, remove it, but, like, they're removing, I think, the psychedelic elements. They're removing course, the yeah. implication that there was drugs involved. And the other thing that they're removing, you can guess, is the, se- the sequence with the with the crows that are, like, minstrels. The racist sequence. The, yeah. yeah. So those two things, of course, they are being removed. Disney sure loved Jim Crow back in, back in the day. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, but it's like so, yeah. But they're they're taking away things, and they're and they're basically like, it's kind of like they're bringing back an old like fast food menu item, and just you know yeah. removing the things that were really taking out the trans fat or whatever. Like it's just well, that's, pandering. That's the that's the thing about a remake, right? Did you say you've seen Nausicaa? Um, yes, no, and I loved Nausicaa specifically the part yeah. when when they go to the like that underworld part. Um, yeah, underneath. That's it. a really great part of the movie, but like. I love that movie. I love the manga. I love that movie. That movie, but uh, honestly, it kind of looks. It kind of looks pretty bad, and the pacing's off. Yeah, right? and there's a lot of like parts when like um, Nausicaa's skirt like lifts up in the wind and it shows her butt, and it just seems like the animators were like, hoo, hoo, hoo. "Well, you know, I disagree with you on that. Actually, um, I think that is like the first hint that Miyazaki is a feminist." Because it's not sexualized at all. It's you don't just, think? I don't think it's sexualized at all. I think it just happens. Because I'm pretty sure she's wearing 
I'm pretty sure she wears pants under the dress, first it's, of all. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like it, it, it's like flesh colored. It doesn't look like a butt, really. I didn't see. I, 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 I always saw them butt. as like, I always saw them as yellow pants. Maybe that's just me, but I, I don't think it's sexualized at all. I think it's just because um, there's uh, in only yesterday there's like, 15 minutes, where, it's just like the girls, the girls in the school find out about their periods, and one of the girls tells her boyfriend like, oh you know, we get periods and this is what it is. And so then the boys go around and they start like flipping up girls skirts and like sliding under their legs and everything. And it's, it's not, but it's not sexualized at all, Mm -hmm. you know, or, um, in my neighbor Totoro, there's times when you see May and, uh, oh gosh, I don't remember the sister's name, but they're just little girls. And you know, they're when they're running around their skirts fly up sometimes and i think i think it's not sexualized at all which is is really nice because it back to nausicaa anyway you know that movie is i think it's pretty poorly paced um yeah i I love it a lot no i know i i i I love it too i i don't even think the runtime i don't even think the runtime is too much I just think it it kind of plods. Sometimes. I I I'm never not interested, but it definitely didn't feel like it had a structure in the way that, like it, it wasn't tight. Like um, again, Spirited Away is very tight. Like things feel like they're happening. There's like yeah. levels that are sort of gone into, descended into. You know, the core of the movie, like when she goes and sees Zaniva. I guess you could argue just because it's like her going deeper into what is already the un- unknown. Like there's a structure yeah. there, and it's pretty. It's at the very end of the movie, but it's pretty. It's it's sort of clear what's going on. Um, Nausicaa, you're just kind of waiting for the next thing to happen, and it's always yeah, cool. But yeah, it's always <clears throat> cool. You're always invested. Yeah, but it's it's just it's just a little bit slow. But like I said, like if they cut twenty mo- twenty minutes out of that movie, I don't. I wouldn't like it. Yeah, I can't think of anything that you could cut. It's just not great pacing. But um, what, we were talking about remakes. Like what what if they remade that movie? You know, five years from now, uh, Miyazaki's in an old folks' home in the mountains. What if what if they remake that movie in the way that they remade Mulan? Because one that I was really excited for was Aladdin. I was really stoked on Aladdin. And they managed to strip all the magic out of that movie. Somehow, some way. With like the grandest production you could ever hope for, they they did it. I mean, Mulan re- looks really cool. I haven't seen it. I'm not gonna pay thirty dollars for Mulan, but that looks really cool. Uh, the Lion King looked like garbage. I don't even know why they did that. Yeah, no, I don't know why they're doing it. I'm I'm I mean, I'm kind of. It didn't start this way, but at this point, I'm like invested in not watching these these live action remakes. I just don't want to. Well, you know what was good though was the Jungle Book. Never saw it. It was, that was good. so long ago too. Though. I don't that was like, like it. I mean, that was Wait, like five really? years ago. Are yeah. talking about the same thing? I, th- I okay. think there were I'm two. I'm thinking about the first movie rendering of that. And it might not have been a Dis. I don't know if it was a Disney movie because I'm not sure if Disney owned um, the story because it's a Kipling story. Yeah, I didn't even know if the first one was a Disney movie. Yes. Was it? Oh, yeah, it was. Uh, 2016. Yeah. Um, But... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about video games for a second, which I know is something that you're not so much I'll just nod I like am. this, so as I have been doing when there's something that I'm not sure like, what to say, because I don't know about it. Yeah. Well, what I, all, all I'm going to say is that the, there's been a trend of remaking games in the same way that there's been a trend of remaking mm-hmm. movies or rebooting franchises and all this. And so many of them turn out so bad, just like the movies do. I mean, I don't know about Mulan. I have a lot of hope for Mulan. I'll wait until I can watch it for free. But The Lion King looks like shit. Aladdin is shit. The Jungle Book was good. But uh, one of one of the most famous video games of all video games was remade and released this year. And that game is Final Fantasy VII. Um, that going back and playing the original Final Fantasy VII now, it, it looks like shit. It's translated badly. Um, the gameplay is like 
it doesn't doesn't hold up so much but the, they did something like intangible with with the remake of that game to make it really really spectacular it's a really great game people have some problems with it uh, I don't personally have any problems with it but there's there's something missing though you know I think I think there's always a certain kind of charm to to the original of something I mean do you even do you even think it's possible for them to remake Spirited Away I think it's possible that in the future there will exist a thing that is the remake of Spirited Away but I don't think it's possible right now to remake Spirited Away and I think that's because it hasn't been remade and I like it that way yeah um, I guess what I'm getting at is that the, there's just there's just something there with these movies. I, I mean, it's I don't know whether it's an accident or if it's by design, but I think these movies have a real uh, a quality to them that is is always just a matter of like right place, right time, right people on the job, and I I just don't know how they could. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't know how. Is there? There's no studio that makes people feel the way that Studio Ghibli makes people feel, right? I mean, nobody thinks that way about Metro Goldwyn Mayer or you know whatever studio Harvey Weinstein was in charge of. I mean, it happens with directors occasionally. I mean, people, the Coen Brothers have it. I suppose Christopher yeah. Nolan has it, even though I think he makes bad movies. Yeah, I don't know. He has an aesthetic. I don't think he anymore has a style. Yeah, I mean, people people think Tenet is going to be great. I don't know. He makes movies that are easy to, like, if you saw the storyboard, it would be easier to, like, group it into chunks. I think that's the defining feature of his movies. Like, <laughs> like Inception and Interstellar and all that shit. It all they all have the same shape. Every, he's been remaking Memento Mori over and over for his entire career, and, and it, it's getting less. And yeah, it's not getting. It's not really going anywhere. I I, I want to say I like Inception. I like it. I have friends who like it. I think for political reasons, I have to maintain that I like it. Um, but I'm over it. I used to love it. I'm over it. I I don't ever. I need just to watch don't care it about it. I mean, good job to Ellen Page for being in the most movie movie that there ever was. The most movie movie that there ever was. Like M. Night Shyamalan, for example. Yeah, let's let's dwell on M. Night Shyamalan. M. Night Shyamalan is a guy that made some of the best movies ever. Or at least one of the best movies ever. Uh, Which I haven't in, seen, by the way. You haven't seen The Sixth Sense? Have not seen it. Wow. Yeah. Do you know the twist? I don't know the twist of The Sixth Sense. Maybe oh, I do. Well, then but... you should watch it right away. Okay. <laughs> we'll pause and you can watch that. And... All right. We'll keep rolling. I think, that's, I think that movie's incredible. Um, but he also made The Last Airbender. Yeah, and a bunch of other things that somehow taken together. If you averaged all of his movies, I think they would equal the average of The Sixth Sense and The Last Airbender. It would be the same average. Yeah. I just Definitely. just from pop culture I mean, knowledge, I know that you, the sixth sense is loved. Were you in Mr. Woods English class where we watched Lady in the Water? No. I think that I think that was our like English one 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 oh one or something. That was like the college English that we took in senior year. And we were supposed to like break down Lady in the Water. And I, I got in trouble for writing about how bad I thought that movie was. And while I was uh, while I was making the new drive for our podcast, which you can uh, you can reach the podcast at depthperceptionpodcast at gmail dot com, um, I, I found the essay that I I wrote about that, um, and it was completely incoherent. I mean, I don't even think I don't even think I was able to understand now why I didn't like the movie back then. I'm not I'm not gonna watch it again. Is that a but Shyamalan movie? Lady in the Water. Yeah, it better be. Or else, uh, or else I'm wasting my own time bringing it up. Lady um, Shyamalan. Sure is. Yep. 
it sure is. I mean, I couldn't even tell you now why I why I think that movie was bad. I bet you it's because I thought M Night Shyamalan made bad movies. Right, and you um, wanted you... because that's because that's what I heard about him, and that's like when I was watching a movie that I knew was by him. I was I was like destined to see it that way. Yeah, but then independently uh, of him, I watched The Last Airbender, and uh, you know I'll say it every time. It comes up like it's my favorite television show that there is. I I don't know how it could end up being supplanted because like it's it's been a part of my life since I was eight years old or nine years old. Um, did you hear? Uh, I, I did hear. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to be the one it's to break it to you, but yeah, it's bad news. Um, pro- I'm probably not gonna watch it. Yeah. Um. I'll stick. I'll read the comic books. I have the lady. Or, uh, I have the Avatar Kyoshi novel. For anybody who doesn't right know, from me. yeah, the the creators of the show are off the Netflix uh, live action. Yep. It's they they walked out. So Netflix, I guess, made a promise to let those guys have their vision be what makes it to screen. And uh, ac- according to Michael and Brian, that is not how it. It wound up yeah. going. Netflix did not keep their promise, which is crazy because all the crap Netflix lets happen, it can't be because it, like it has to be because they were just letting people do what they wanted to do, right? And they had a chance. They had a chance to like set right a decade of wrongs. Yeah, like they, they had a chance to like <laughs> lift a, a great curse. Franchise. Basically, they had a chance to lift a curse. Yeah, they did, and they chose not to. And that movie, that show is going to be crap. You know, it's destined to be now. Um, I mean, they even said, like, we don't expect this to be, like, this show is not going to be the quality that, that you would have gotten. Which is so sad. But, you know, the same the same thing happens when you watch a movie from Studio Ghibli that's not by Miyazaki or Takahata. I, I mean, Goro, Goro is directing... A uh, an Ursula K. Le Guin adaptation. His second Ursula Le Guin. Oh, what's the adaptation. what? What one is it? It's um. It's called like Earwig and the Witch or something. Uh, I don't know that one. I think it's by Ursula K. Le Guin. Um. Oh no, this is by Diana Wynne Jones. Okay. It's the wind that got me. Um. But he, regardless, he directed he directed the Earth Sea movie, which is helped a lot by the fact that she wrote a good book. Yeah, which Hosmic is reading right now, actually. I mean, I assume it's a good book. It's a very cool premise, yeah. and it's successful. And you don't get to be that necessarily if you're crap. That's right. I mean, J.K. Rowling did it, but she's a one-off. Um, but. I mean, even though even though Earthsea looks like most other Ghibli movies, it, the, there's something missing there. I mean, Ocean Waves is great, looks like a Ghibli movie made by Ghibli staff, but it's not it's not the same as as a Miyazaki movie or a Takahata movie. Uh, there there's something like. I don't want to say spiritual and sound like I use crystals as deodorant or something, but there there is like a spiritual quality of those movies in in, in the sense that it connects you with with some part of you that almost always this happens. It connects you with like some part of you that maybe you you weren't aware of or you had forgotten about. You know what what only yesterday did for me, which is. A movie I'm probably not going to stop talking about for a while. After after having seen it yesterday, I um, you know, it just the whole time it had me thinking about, you know, how I was as a kid, and what that led to me being now. It made me think of how my like. I think what that movie is about is is how adults. Whether they mean to or not, 
stifle kids. And kids become adults, that whether they mean to or not, stifle kids. And and the thing that keeps you from doing that is is being able to remember being being the kid. And uh, I don't know. I, I uh, last Easter, not this. I don't think it was this past Easter, but I think it was Easter last year. My cousins came up from Maryland with their four little children. And I remember being like, I don't know. I, I don't think they felt this way. And they probably really don't now because I got them some kick-ass Christmas presents. But I, I was just thinking about like how shitty I was to them. You know, and I don't, I don't think it was mean or anything. I mean, I, I never scolded them for anything. But it, it reminded, it, it just made me think of like how I was to them. And there's this quote that I heard and I don't, I don't remember where I heard it. But it's, what, what the quote was is that you spend two or three years of your life learning how to walk and talk. And you spend the rest of your life being told to sit down and shut up. And um, I, that whole movie just made me think about that. Because the the Tycho character is she's like a put upon office worker who's who's not happy to be working in an office, but she's afraid to stop working in the office because like the culture of Japan is like very much about working. I mean there's not a room there's not like room to be a hippie in Japan, I don't think. Um at least not when that movie was made. Is it's the impression I get. I mean, for God's sake, they 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 like lock up unwanted office workers in lonely rooms until they quit the job, so that they don't have to fire them. But uh, there, there's just something about each of these movies that that connects to a different part of you, and you know, for for me, it's it's always the um. You know, it's always the recollection of, of childhood as an adult. It's always, you know, the the care that you have to take for nature. Or um, there's a scene in there's a scene in my neighbor Totoro where uh, where the two sisters are in the rain without an umbrella, and they sit under a shrine, and like when they're getting up to get on the bus or in the car that's picking them up or whatever it is, they just, they just make a quick turn and like bow and thank the shrine for, for keeping them out of the rain. And there, there's things like that, that like just small moments that are dotted throughout these movies that really like touch me in all the right ways. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know if that's something that you've, you feel, um, or our vast audience feels. I mean, I would love, what I would love to get is like a list of the great slice of life movies because I, th I think that's got to be my favorite genre of film. I mean, it's my favorite genre of film is definitely not action or crime or rom coms or anything like that. Like, I, th I think it's the great slice of life movies that I love the most. I met a guy while I was working the other day who told me that, oh, brother, where art thou? Um, what did he say? He said, the secrets of the universe are contained within its walls, which is cool, but he also was kind of racist. Um, not that those things have to do with each other directly, but... <laughs> I'll have to watch that movie because that's one that I remember not liking very much. I loved it as a kid. I loved it as a kid. Haven't seen it in a long time. Not sure exactly how I would relate to it now. I think I think I was mostly not interested in watching live action movies as a kid. I was much more interested in cartoons. Um, but the Coen Brothers movies are all slice of life movies. I mean, they're weird. They're weird lives. They're not. They're mostly not real lives. I mean, maybe maybe True Grit is as close as it gets, but that's another remake. It's way better than John Wayne. <laughs> as Rooster Cogburn, but they're, they're all slice of life movies. Uh, I mean, or they're, they're a bunch of slices of life that make up, you know, the whole, the cops in Fargo have their own slice. Steve Buscemi and Peter Stormare have their own slice. 
or um you know the wife of uh the wife of Llewellyn in in No Country for Old Men you know she has her own things going on and you get to see them and you know Tommy Lee Jones takes the time to drink a glass of milk that what's his name Javier Bardem yeah what's the what's the character I don't know I well Javier Bardem like left part of most of a glass of milk behind at this house and you just take time to like watch Tommy Lee Jones drink it and like complain about it being warm or whatever he does you know it's things like that that like connect you to the real world in ways that I think a lot of movies try to take you out of the real world um I mean I don't there's nothing there's nothing that like makes me emotional in a superhero movie. Everybody everybody loves like the the Marvel movies that have been coming out over the last decade. I just I couldn't care less about them. Because there there's no truth in those movies. It's it's all escape without you know anything to anything to tie you down. Thank you for listening to Depth Perception. You can support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel and kicking us a little bit of scratch on Patreon.